Gentlemen, I'll say gentlemen rather than ladies and gentlemen, because I know that most people who watch me are uh, men, young men. And I know that because of the type of questions I've been getting. I understand a lot of you are here from Instagram. A lot of you who follow me uh, on my other socials have come here to hopefully have your questions answered. Uh, and I'm doing a live Q&A today, so it's completely unscripted. And also, no fancy sound effects, no stupid introductions, no stupid songs playing before the podcast goes out. It's just me on my personal Rumble channel, Talisman Tate, talking to my audience. So I want to begin this by telling you exactly what we have in store. I have a cigar. And by the time this cigar is finished, I am going to log off. So you have as much time as it takes me to smoke this excellent Cuban cigar to ask your questions. Now I have staff behind the scenes monitoring this chat and all the good questions that come up are going to be sent to my phone along with the ones that I've saved from Instagram earlier. And I'm gonna tell all of you a little bit of knowledge about the world and hopefully help you young men out a little bit. Now, I'm not gonna like this just yet. The first question I'm going to read is actually something to do with what I'm about to say. I'm gonna start with uh, an urgent um, appeal to my friend um, in uh, well, all of my friends in politics, I guess, to do something about the Joe Exotic situation. Now, before you guys start, at least 500 or 600 questions have come in saying, why do you always post about Joe Exotic? What are you trying to do with Joe Exotic? Um, and I'm going to make this very, very clear. I believe that the situation with Joe Exotic is the biggest uh, case of injustice that we've seen in recent times. It's very clear, even from watching the documentary, that he was essentially just hot mic'd by some idiots making jokes with uh, FBI wires inside of their jackets. Um, and, you know, he made a few tasteless jokes, but he obviously had no serious intention of committing any crime. And they've locked him up for 20 plus years. And everyone forgot at the end of Tiger King and at the end of the show that this man was still in prison. Um, you know, he's sick at the moment. You know, he's not doing too well. Uh, I want to get him home to his to his friends and his family ASAP. So, you know, spread the word, spread the love, uh, donate any money on Super Chats to this uh, broadcast. All the money, and I will need it, is is going to the Free Joe Exotic Fund. Uh, I know Joe watches the show, so shout out to you as well. Um, but everybody, share this kind of uh, news to your story. Don't let it be silenced and don't let it go completely, you know, uh, forgotten. Because it's absolutely sickening. Which brings me to my first question which is why I brought up Joe Exotic first. Um, the first question that came through on Instagram, which I thought was very interesting, and I knew I was going to talk about Joe anyway, was what do you think of rich people that have tigers and lions as pets? Is it a go or is it a no-go? So to make this very clear, I would say, no matter what you want to be in life and no matter what you want to do, whether it be you know a dog trainer or a kickboxer or a zoo owner, it takes certain amounts of passion, time, and dedication. Uh, what do I think of rich people having tigers and lions was a very good question because rich people can do it better than anyone else. I don't agree that anybody who is on a budget should be, you know, locking an animal in a cage in their house, neglecting it, not spending time with it, making the animal not feel uh, at home or, or a member of the family. I do believe that is cruel. And I think a lot of people who look at these big cat owners are happy to tar them all with the same brush. You know, some crazy guy in Oklahoma who, you know, locks one tiger away in his living room and then it goes crazy and kills his family. That's not what, what pet ownership is about uh, when it comes to big cats. And I know this because recently, a few days ago, I did a tour of a zoo with one Mr. Belhasa, a wonderful man here in Dubai, who has the time, energy, passion, and resources to take care of his animals. Um, and he was showing me all around his private zoo and he does uh, big cat ownership right. So I'm completely against animal cruelty but um, you can absolutely own tigers and big cats if you uh, choose and if you have the, the energy and resources to dedicate to it. So that's Joe Exotic and, and big cats out of the way. Um, the only reason I answered that question first is because it feeds off you know, my initial appeal, appeal that I was going to make to everybody else. And now I'm going to get to probably the most asked question that I've been asked, um, not just today, not just yesterday, and not just on this Ask Me Anything and not just on my Instagram. In the last month, the question that I have been asked the very most is how has Andrew's conversion to Islam affected your brotherhood? How has it affected your relationship? Is it going to affect your relationship? Is it going to be strange living in a household 
um, with two faiths? Are you going to convert? These are a bunch of questions that have obviously come through, and I'm going to try to answer all of them uh, within the next few minutes. So Andrew's initial point um, about Islam, he was making many months ago before he officially went loud with his conversion. I knew about his, his thoughts and uh, you know, the way his, his heart was leaning for a very long time. And Andrew made a very good point, a very strong point. And his point about Islam was this. He said, if you walk around uh, a, a Catholic country, a country like Italy, and you insult Jesus Christ, or if you walk around England and you insult Jesus Christ, you could say offensive things about him. You could tell an English person or an Italian, here you go, say something bad about Jesus Christ or, or your God. Here's some money. Will you do that? And people would do that largely as a whole. Um, and also saying bad things about you know, Jesus Christ and their God. Nobody would face any repercussions. You could walk around the street freely saying these slanderous things, which is very rude and very impolite. And nobody would do anything about it. However, in the Muslim world, you see where I'm going here, such an uh, example is simply unthinkable. A Muslim would never insult his own prophet. He'd never insult his own God. And, and that too, if you were in a Muslim country or even in the presence of Muslim people and you were to insult their God or, or their prophet, they would be absolutely furious. Someone might even punch you in the face. And that's very fair enough. But what Andrew failed to mention, which is a point that I think I'm going to raise right here, is there are people in the world who will punch you in the face if you insult Jesus Christ and if you insult... Um, uh, if you insult Jesus Christ or the Virgin Mary or anything. And those people are the Muslims. Now, if you don't know religion and you don't know religious history very well, then I guess you don't know that one of the most prophet and one of the most important prophets in Islam is Jesus, son of Mary, as they refer to him, or Jesus Christ, as us Christians call him. So this Dubai, the Middle East, the United Arab Emirates, the Muslim world is a part of the world where you could not walk around and freely insult Jesus. So I feel perfectly at home in the Middle East and I feel perfectly at home living with my brother who is now a Muslim. He's going to put a Quran up above his title belts in the house. I have no problem with that book being in my house. I am very happy um, for my brother and the decision he made. I think that it's going to benefit him uh, in the long run. I think that he's a lot happier than I've seen him in a very long time and good for him. Now, I was asked about my own conversion or potential conversion, and, and here was my answer. My answer was very simple. Somebody, some idiot, actually, here in the Middle East, some British guy said to me, oh yeah, if you convert to Islam, that'd be really beneficial to you and it would help you out in lots of ways. And I explained to him, I said, that's not how conversion works, my friend. And if I were to live in the Middle East, you know, although living as a Christian, even if it was more difficult, which it's not because it's a very free, open country with freedom of religion, um, I would not convert for the reason of getting any kind of material um, or social benefit. I don't think that's how conversion works. I don't even think you choose to convert no more than you choose to believe that the sky is blue or that the, uh, the ocean's filled with water. I believe that conversion is something that happens to you. Now, I've been doing a lot of reading. Um, a lot of people in Dubai have gifted me some wonderful books, The Miracles of the Prophet Muhammad and so on. And I, I enjoy reading this material. Conversion isn't something that I plan to do because I don't believe it's something people plan to do. I believe it's something that naturally happens to people and something that... Um, you know, you don't choose because you don't choose to change your mind. You don't choose to change your mind. Your mind just naturally changes as you're persuaded. So as for a personal conversion, I will say no, that's probably not coming. Um, it's certainly not coming yet. Um, if it does happen, it will be an organic process. But never, nevertheless, I, you know, I believe that Christians and Muslims are now finally united. So over the history of Christianity and Islam, there's been lots of fights, and there's been lots of arguments, and there's been lots of wars, and the Crusades, even the Christians went in and tried to take Muslim land from them, and the, and the, the Ottoman Empire too invaded Europe through Romania and got even to the gates of Vienna. There was lots of beef between Christians and Muslims, but that was obviously due to religious uh, differences because people were very, uh, there were, uh, uh, let's call them zealots back then, but also it was about political power. It was about uh, who controls the land, who controls the laws, who controls the countries. I believe that Christianity and Islam are now closer linked than ever before. 
I believe they're closer linked um, now than they even were in the in the day of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who, who by the way, encouraged religious freedom and lived uh, completely peacefully with Christians. I believe today we are united by a common enemy. I think that the evil actions of what's happening in the, the world, uh, the, the degeneracy, the, the perversions, the, the horrible things that we, we see every single day on our TV screens, uh, the atrocities committed in the name of all sorts of um, nonsense, even, you know, uh, reproductive freedom, the, the, the millions and uh, millions of, uh, of babies being aborted every single day. It's, um, it's tragic. And I believe that Christianity and Islam now stand hand in hand as brothers against the moral degeneracy of the world. So I don't see a time in the future where there's going to be um, any kind of beef between Muslims and Christians. And if you think there's going to be any beef in my house between me and my brother, you are wrong. So I think that covers the uh, Andrew Muslim countries. The Andrew Muslim questions. Because as you can imagine, I've had about 100 billion of those. And this is a topic. Another question that I got. Shout out to Maury Zaidon on um, Instagram, which is not really related to, to Islam, but more related to the culture of the Middle East. And it was about the World Cup. And because we're not on YouTube, because we are on Rumble, I can happily talk about such topics in a, a, a nice, a polite and entertaining way without risks of being banned. So people said, Tristan, I wonder if I can bring up the things happening at the World Cup and your take on it. I feel that the West have made football political nowadays. I love you guys. Now, thank you for the question. That's a very, very interesting question. My opinion on it is actually very simple. People, when they come to countries, and I will say the same about the United Kingdom and the United States or any country in the world, need to respect the country's uh, culture, the country's principles, the country's laws, if you go to Singapore, you're not allowed to have chewing gum, for example. Chewing gum is illegal. They don't like the way it sticks to the streets. It makes garbage cleanup more difficult. They've made chewing gum illegal. Now, I can say, oh, well, you know, we chew gum in my country. I'm going to go over to Singapore and chew gum. Good. I hope they throw me in jail. And I hope they throw any people like that in jail who are openly disrespecting the laws and rules of a country. The West, you have to understand, is not a moral superpower. They are not the kings of morality who set in stone the laws of the universe and tell every single country, you are immoral, you are not immoral, you are just, you are unjust. The, the crimes that the West commits from the proxy wars even being fought right now in certain countries that I won't mention for the sake of, <laughs> of not bringing that topic up, um, to the, the open invasions and, and, and murder and open genocide of, of tens of thousands of people, the crimes that the West commits um, certainly dis, uh, disqualify it from being the moral high ground of the world. So when English people, German people, and American people try to get high and mighty on a place like Qatar and say, oh, well, you know, I'm not allowed to wear rainbow flag t-shirts and rainbow flag armbands and rainbow colored hair and rainbow flag pants. I'm not allowed to do that. Why aren't I allowed to do, do that in Qatar? Why can't I come to your football stadiums and wear all these rainbow colored flags? The thing is about this, in the Middle East, Privacy is very, very respected. There are lots of gay people who live in Dubai. There's lots of gay people who live all throughout the Middle East and they go to their houses behind their closed doors and their business is their business. And uh, people have been living like this for a very long time. I believe that if you are trying to wear a rainbow t-shirt to a Qatari stadium, you are openly provoking the Qatari people. And the Qatari people have the right to tell you to go home and to change your t-shirt because if all you have is rainbow t-shirts, if every day you wear rainbow t-shirts, if you have a rainbow, if your face is tattooed with a rainbow and you got that rainbow tattoo 30 years ago because you like the story of Noah's Ark and the rainbow being a symbol of God's covenant with man, I'm sure, I'm sure they'd be more accepting. If rainbow flag colored t-shirts were all that the British wore or all that the Germans wore, if it was the fashion in England and Germany to wear these things, but it's not. Nobody ever wears these things. So when you're doing it at their stadiums and trying to get into their stadiums and get to their football games and get seen on TV with your rainbow colored flag, it's a virtue signal in the most um, ugly and, and promiscuous 
an exorbitant way. You, you should not be doing that to the Qatari people. And you are an idiot for putting them in the position for having to tell you to go home and change your shirt. So I believe that it is open provocation on the culture of, of Qatar. I believe that if you have the intention of coming to Qatar and trying to virtue signal in this way, don't. You know, stay at home, watch the football games at home, wear your rainbow t-shirt at home. Uh, it's no problem. I don't understand why you try to do this to another country and another country's culture. In exactly the same way that English people get mad when, um, when protesters who were against the British Armed Forces some years ago were setting fire to poppies in the, in the city center. If you buy a poppy at, in the city center, the, the World War I uh, memorial uh, decoration, the small red flower, for those of you who don't know what that is, and you go home and light it on fire, no one's going to arrest you and no one's going to care. But when you openly provoke uh, the English people in that way, they have the right to, to protest and get mad at you and throw you in jail. But the English people don't do that, of course, because uh, England's too soft. But yeah, don't go to Qatar and provoke them. And, and, and don't you know think that your countries are the arbitrators of what is moral and what is not because the behavior of the western countries especially throughout the last 40 or 50 years has been some of the most disgusting and some of the most ir immoral behavior anywhere on the face of the planet so these people aren't the boss so take the t-shirt off and go home now i've got eleven thousand people watching now with these eleven thousand people watching what i would really like is you all to share this stream Put it out everywhere. Make sure everybody's watching. Um, if it gets up high enough, I may have a second cigar. Otherwise, your time is running low. So, <laughs> Jesus, these questions. This is a very good question. So I do understand that I'm in a position where I was very lucky to have a, a good father figure and an older brother in my life to guide me over some of the hurdles that young men face. But a lot of hurdles that, you know, young men face, they haven't got anybody to look up to and they haven't got anybody to turn to. So I got this question. He asked me to keep his name secret and I will for, for obvious reasons. And I thought, you know what, let me just give this little bit of life advice out to the younger man out there. He said, I broke up with my ex. Um, when do I know if it's too late? She's asking for, for me back. How do I know if it's too late to take her back or, or, or should I take her back or should I not take with her back? Uh, take her back. The answer to whether you or not you should take an ex-girlfriend back is very simple. And I know this, and most fully grown men uh, probably know this. Um, but for the younger guys out there, let me explain to you exactly what it is. If she has had another boyfriend or another sexual partner or another relationship since the breakup, it is too late to take her back. It is over at that point. Because no matter what happens in the relationship, no matter if you get married, have kids, if you stay together for a very long time, because it didn't, that all happened because it didn't work out with the guy who she was with after your breakup. So you are always going to be plan B. You're always going to be the fallback guy. You're always going to be the idiot that's always there. So if she's had a week or two and, you know, hung out with her girlfriends and cried into her pillow, by all means, take her back. The moment there's been another guy in the scene at all, she's only interested in taking you back and getting back with you because it didn't work out with him. So don't let yourself be um played like that yeah don't be second place to anybody so that's when it's too late so i've kept your name out of that but um no more advice for you because now you're sending me a bunch of other questions because i've just picked your question out but it's fine how do you find a good tailor for your suits and clothes thanks i'm sick of talking about my suits and i'm sick of telling everybody where my tailor is the best tailoring in the world is on savile row in london Find a shop there and buy suits there if you can afford it. But there are good tailors in basically any city in the world. So that's a bit of a stupid question. I don't actually know why I wrote that down. I thought I'd want to talk about my suits. I wrote these down hours and hours ago. But after getting dressed up and looking amazing as I always do and a bunch of more questions coming in about my suit, I'm just like, I'm not going to talk about clothing. I don't think that's a good idea. I'm 34, rusty Jedi Knight. And I've had many relationships in the past, but I'm no longer interested in the game. I want to work on myself and my finances and focus on helping my mother and her elderly age. Is this wrong? Why would anything that makes you happy and doesn't hurt anybody else be wrong? You have to understand, I think that the real definition of, of right and wrong actions are, are whether they cause other people harm. And I think that's everybody's definition. So if you're 34, you're tired of the game, what you, you're tired of women 
you know, being no good and breaking up with me or you, or, or maybe you're successful with women and you're just tired of meeting all of them. Uh, whatever you mean by that question, there's nothing wrong at 34 with working on yourself and your finances and focus on helping your mother in her uh, elderly age. I'm 34. You're exactly the same age as me. I am too working on myself, trying to build myself up, working on my finances, although they're pretty secure. I'm always trying to do better. And I, I care about taking uh, care of my mother too. Yeah. I'm certainly not uh, chasing tail around like I was when I was 21 uh, because, you know, I've realized as I'm older and smarter that there are better things to do. I, what I would advise you though is Rusty Jedi Knight. Um, you're only 34. Do this for a couple years, but eventually you are going to need a woman because you are going to need kids. And having kids is a very important mission in any man's life. So yeah, by all means, work on yourself. I don't understand why that would be a negative thing. That's actually a very beautiful thing. And I wish you the best of luck. What are your thoughts on jumping on testosterone replacement therapy at the age of 22? I'll stop you right there. It's shacks. That is rubbish. No 22 year old should be on any kind of steroid. I can see cases for testosterone replacement therapy for people in their upwards of 40, maybe, maybe uh, late 30s. I could see the case for that, uh, for upping your te testosterone level and trying to get your energy levels back to when you were much younger. You're 22 years of age. Do you exercise regularly? Do you eat right? How much alcohol do you drink? Do you smoke? You know, why don't you look at what testosterone is, look at your, your current life and, uh, the, the, and your current habits and try to up your testosterone level naturally. Hang out with more women in a non-friendly manner, uh, if you know what I mean, wink, wink. But yeah, there's no excuse to be injecting anything into your fucking arms at this age. I think that's really pathetic. I think that's a really stupid thing to ask. I think you know the answer to that. You should be at your absolute physical peak uh, in terms of testosterone. And um, yeah, you're, you're, you're clearly not, I don't know why you would consider doing something so dangerous. Hey man. I have a question. What is your take on the whole climate crisis? Do you think it's a big deal? Do you think more action needs to be taken? Are you and your brother against taking action yourselves? I am super against taking action against climate change. And I will tell you why. Sea levels are not rising. That's been proven to be false. Ice caps are not melting, but the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere are going up and humans probably do contribute to that. I'm not saying it causes more extreme weather. I'm not saying the earth is getting colder or hotter. First it was global warming, global warming is over. Now they're just calling it climate change. Um, it's massively politicized, but one, I'm not here to talk about whether it's real or not. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you two scenarios. One, it's very real and the world is ending because of it. And two, it's not real and it's a Chinese conspiracy. I'm going to give you my answer on both of these so you can adopt a healthy mindset because my answer to both of them is exactly the same. The answer is, and when I say this, I'm not saying it from a place of ignorance. When I say it's none of my fucking business to try to stop climate change, I really do mean that. Let's take the last crisis in pollution. The last crisis in human pollution, humans polluting, was the dark in the Middle Ages, after the Dark Ages, into the Middle Ages, when people started living in cities and towns. Human feces and excrement and urine was everywhere. You could not walk down the streets. People threw it out of their windows. There was no sewage systems in place. Uh, a lot of the stones, if you look at the city of Pompeii in, in Rome that was buried, the stones have stepping stones over the roads because the roads were filled even in some Roman cities with human excrement, feces, mess, animal dung, etc. Now, every city on earth from Paris to, to uh, London to Rome were covered in this stuff. And it was a real health crisis. People were dying, uh, cholera, all sorts of diseases. Uh, people were, would, the, the water was infected. People had to drink alcoholic drinks, boil their water first. It was a mess. How did that problem get solved? I'll tell you how it didn't get solved. It didn't get solved by protests and it didn't get solved by one person saying, you know what, I'm not gonna urinate in this bucket and throw it out the window. I'm just gonna walk 10 miles every time I do it. Cause that wouldn't have made a difference. It really wouldn't have. 
it got solved on the governmental level. It got solved on the level of the cities and the governments and the kings of Europe getting together and thinking, you know what, we need to construct vast sewage systems under these cities that flush this garbage out, keep our cities clean. And on a governmental level, when the governments had enough money, the governments fixed the problem. It is not my job to worry about climate change. And it is not my job to worry about climate change, even though I am a man with 28 different uh, supercars in uh, Romania and three supercars here in Dubai, me driving supercars is not going to change the inevitable outcome of this horrible, dangerous climate change that's going to destroy the world. We're, we're doing the it's going to destroy the world route right now. What's going to happen is some smart ass, some researcher in China, India, Russia, one of the countries that are the future of humanity, is going to realize a way of stopping or of at least trapping the carbon dioxide that humans release into the atmosphere and getting rid of it somehow. That's what's going to fix the problem. If you, if you knew that the nine largest container ships in the world, the nine largest ships, boats on earth, pollute more per day than every single car on the roads in the United Kingdom combined, you would understand that living in England and buying a Tesla, which is, by the way, charged by your power plant, which emits coal and uh, CO2 via its coal and oil burning, isn't going to fix the problem. If you buy a Tesla and say, it's for climate change, it is a virtue signal. So I'm going to keep my Bugattis, I'm going to keep my Ferraris, and the more cars I buy, the more taxes the government has off me, and the better armed it is to deal with climate change. And if climate change isn't real, then my answer is the same. Not my fucking problem. Not dealing with it. And if I was dealing with it, I'd be wasting the time. Um, I'll talk very briefly about these protesters in England. These are What are they called? No to oil, insulate Britain. These idiots who keep blocking motorways. Um, hope I'm not at the front of that line one day. Hope I'm not in England and in a hurry and close enough to see you stuck in my car. That's all I'm going to say. And I feel like everyone in England should adopt the exact same attitude. Okay, what's next? This cigar is excellent. Should I speak briefly about cigars? Lots of questions about cigars, but I'm not that interested in talking about cigars. Anything Cuban is good for all of your cigar questions. This is a good one that just came in. DJ Afi, DJ Afi, do you think the time for becoming wealthy is running out? And do you think that we could finally see a recession in the near future? Yes, I believe that the time to get wealthy, wealthy, in an easy and a quick way has run out already. I'm going to tell you why. We've all heard of, heard of the gold rush, haven't we? The gold rush was a time when in certain rivers in California, large nuggets of gold were found and people went nuts. People all moved out to California and lots of people got very rich because there was gold in the hills and everyone was panning for gold, searching the rivers for gold, mining for gold, and lots of going to tie on to another question I've got very nicely. A gold rush has just happened and the gold rush we've just seen is the easy money there was to make in bullshit crypto coins. Um, Bitcoin has a use case, Ethereum has a use case, Chainlink and a few other cryptos have a use case and they're going to last well on into the future. Um, they might even be the future of currency. People who own them now might be the richest people in the world in five or ten years. But I'll tell you what isn't going to exist. Bullshit pump and dump crypto nonsense coins that kids can buy for a few thousand dollars and become millionaires overnight. The time of easy money is over. The gold rush is over. There's no more easy money in the way there used to be. There's no way you're going to draw a little pixelated picture of a monkey or banana or pig or a ninja and sell it for $600,000 anymore. The NFT craze is over. That goes to show that the easy money days in crypto are completely over. So getting wealthy is possible. It's always been possible. And during the worst recessions in the world, people have made money. Getting rich, possible again. But it's going to take a lot more hard work than it's ever taken before. The days of the free money on the internet have ended absolutely. There is... There was um, hope for the crypto market. 
I believe that the days of NFTs and pump and dump shit coins could have came back if Sam Bankman Freed hadn't fucked up with FTX. I believe that that was the nail in the coffin that has killed the crypto market in terms of all of its bullshit, all of its NFTs, all of its pump and dump coins, all of its nonsense, fucking meme based tokens. That's over. And I think Sam Bankman Freed, by losing $200 billion of investor money, has taken so much stupid money out of the market, the smart money isn't going to buy into these scams. Um, and I've had a lot of questions about what I think about the Sam Bankman Freed and the FTX situation. And I will touch on this because I feel very passionately about this. I feel like there's more to this than meets the eye. So I'm going to go full conspiracy theorist for a moment. And I'm going to entertain some ideas for half a second. And I'm going to talk about Sam Bankman Free and his company and who he actually is. Imagine you are the architect of the matrix. And imagine you like fiat money. You like everyone to have their dollars, everyone to have their money in their banks. You're in charge of the money. You're God of the money, the money boss. And a bunch of internet nerds who you don't know who no one knows, have created this new currency. Oh, everyone's got Bitcoin, everyone's got Ethereum. They're changing your real money for it. The value of crypto is going up. That would be very scary if you were the architect of the matrix. So what better way? Because if people fuck with real money, fiat money, like Bernie Madoff did, he ran an investment scam. Look up Bernie Madoff if you're not old enough. It was a Ponzi scheme where lots of people were investing real money through a, you know, through a real powerful, important people through his real looking investment scheme, it turned out to be a big scam. He's in jail now for the rest of his life. Whether or not FTX is a conspiracy depends on whether Sam Bankman Freed goes to jail. Because let me tell you, if you're the architect of the matrix, what better way to fuck with the nerds who have been undermining your authority than putting some likable, friendly, chubby, curly haired, non threatening dork as the face of this new system? Hey, I'm. Sam, you can put your crypto here. I'm an awesome guy. I love everybody. I'm going to give all my money away. I don't really care about being rich. I just want to empower everyone to make money with crypto. Also, I'm the second largest donor to the party who just won the American election. And then Sam Bankman Freed scams everyone, takes everyone's money, fucks everything up, ruins the crypto market, and everyone ends up broke. Think about it. Think about it. Wouldn't that be a masterful chess move? Wouldn't that be a swipe at your opponent's queen if you were the architect of the Matrix? That's a Tristan Tate original conspiracy theory. I think, I don't know, maybe some other people are saying the same thing. A lot of smart people probably are. But that aside, let's pretend none of that's true. What do I actually think? Yeah, I think that don't trust men who don't value money. Uh, don't trust men who can't get laid. All the tenants that me and Andrew uh, talk about you know, this guy had billions of dollars, 22 billion to, exa to be exact. He was like, oh, well, I uh, drive a Toyota because I like my Toyota. It's a good car. Nerds like him with no muscle, no power, no influence don't get rich to give all their money away and drive Toyotas. There's something he was doing behind the scenes. There had to be something he was doing behind the scenes because everybody, every nerd like that cares about power. Look at the people who are in charge of a lot of the social networks and the big uh, electronics and, uh, and, and powerful companies today. They're nerds and nerds love power. Also, don't trust a man who can't get laid. Have you seen his ex-girlfriend? FTX was a group of fucking nerds living in the Bahamas. And I don't think it was a sex cult like people think. I think what it was, as none of them had any women, but there was one girl who kind of knew them. This geeky girl with glasses. Everyone's seen pictures of her now. The FTX girl. Google FTX girl. Her, her image will come up. And first she was dating one of them. Then she was dating the other. Then she's dating the third. And I don't believe it was a sex cult. I really don't. I, I would actually, uh, I think I know more about male and female dynamics than the people who write those conspiracy theories that FTX was a sex cult. What I would say is, these guys have no game. They can't get women. And they're happy to take the ex-girlfriend of their friend or their other friend because they all like her because they all have secret fantasies where they jerk their little dicks off to her and just be with her for a while and then pass her on if she breaks up with them they're probably upset oh she's with this guy now who's in our team well she's free to date who she likes watch one woman try to get into my group of friends 
the war room leadership, for example, the leadership of the war room, let's say, let one of their exes or one of my exes try to get with them and see what happens. You think she's going to be what at the war room events holding my, my, my guy's hand or, or their ex-girlfriend's going to be at the war room events holding my hand. Well, she's with me now. Never trust these type of people. And I saw it in his face when he was first talking about, I only like Toyotas. I'm not gonna buy a, bun uh, a, a nice car. I took all my money off the FTX over a year ago. So if you lost out and you knew who Sam Bankman Freed was, your fault. But yeah, keep that conspiracy theory in mind. Also don't trust nerds, ever. Do not trust nerds. I'm gonna talk about the real world um, at the end of this podcast. But yeah, the time to get wealthy is running out. Oh my god. Why would you ask me this? 101 Mo. I'm 20, do you think boxing is worth it? It seems to be extremely whiskey, and you might not make it out with a proper brain. Should I look for something else? You haven't got a proper brain to be sending me these stupid-ass questions. You know the answer. Do I rant on this guy or not? I don't think I do, do I? Boxing is absolutely worth it. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. I might, I'm gonna box, I might make it out, might not make it out with a proper brain. Let me tell you something. If you do not box, you might not make it out of a bad encounter in the world with your fucking life. You might get head stomped, knocked out cold and killed in front of your fucking family if you don't know how to defend yourself. It's a necessary risk. Learn how to fight, learn how to defend yourself. What a fucking stupid question. Why would you even ask me that? Are you trying to upset me today? Jesus Christ. This is a good one. And I don't know if I should do this. She know. Okay, yeah, yeah, screw it. Okay, Tristan, where is the best place in the world to avoid the next uh, coronavirus lockdown scam? So there's this conspiracy out there that coronavirus and all the lockdowns and all the vaccine mandates was just a massive scam and it was totally unnecessary and didn't save anybody. I'm saying nothing, but there that's a that's a thought that a lot of people have right now. That this coronavirus thing was completely unnecessary. And everyone's asking, now this young kid is asking me right now, what's the best place to avoid that? There is no place, my friend. The place is inside of your own human zygote you have to become a person who can avoid it you can be a normal guy in belarus or sweden the countries that didn't actually lock everyone down and next time they could just lock you down you don't know but if you're powerless then you're powerless so what you have to be is the type of person that's hard to kill the type of person who is out of the matrix anywhere outside of the matrix is a place you can avoid it. Are you working a normie job that your company might make you take experimental vaccines to keep your job? Is that your only source of income? And is that the only thing you can do to continue providing for your family? Then I don't care what country you live in, my friend, you cannot avoid the next wave of bullshit if it comes back. What I would certainly say is become the type of person that cannot be locked down. I lived in Romania, which did lock down. I lived in Romania, which did try to mandate vaccines. And when this, um, when these lockdowns and all these things came about, me and my brother were just traveling the world freely on private jets with papers uh, that permitted us to cross borders into various countries, hanging out with who I wanted to, going to, to parties that maybe shouldn't have happened. I was living my life very normally. I was one of the least affected people in the world, and that had nothing to do with where I lived. It was all to do with who I am. So become that guy. Don't worry about where you live. Where you live is actually the wrong question, which is why I decided to answer you in the end. And we all know how to become that guy. Network, connections, power, money. That's what makes you free. So before I get on to do I watch any television, and I'm going to talk about in depth the greatest TV show in history and the only TV show and series I have ever watched in my life. Let me talk about this. What are the nicest things in existence that rich people have and use that broke people don't even know about? This is a good one. This is a good one because I've only known about these things 
in recent times. I believe that broke people in the civilized world, not the United States, actually, this is one country that does not count because medical care and health insurance is all about how much money you have. But if you're from England, you think, oh, I have health care. If you're from Sweden, you think, oh, great, I have health care. If you're German, you think, okay, if I have health care, I can go to hospital if I have a problem. You don't have health care at all. You haven't got a fucking clue what health care is. Let me explain to you how healthcare works. There are two or three different types of chemo that the NHS, the National Health Service of the UK, can afford to buy. If you get cancer of the lung, they will pump you through one of these types of chemo. Your hair will fall out, you'll be very sick, and it's a race to the bottom to see what kills you first, the chemo or the cancer. And I sympathize deeply with cancer patients. Um, I have a friend who's been battling cancer for many years. I've lost a friend to cancer. It's a very serious and very horrible disease. But if you're English and you think I have cancer, you're like, thank God I've got the NHS because I have health care. No, you do not. You have the most entry level, basic health care. It's the equivalent of if the government gave everyone free food, you're on bread and butter. That's it. But there's other foods out there that you don't know about. You just eat your daily food. Oh, bread and butter. The government feeds me. It's great. You don't have health care at all. Let me tell you, explain to you what happens when you're a multimillionaire and you have cancer. You go to a specialist in Switzerland, perhaps. Switzerland does this. Dubai does this. They will take a piece of your tumor from your lung via a keyhole surgery. And they will replicate the tumor in a lab. This is very time consuming and very expensive. The NHS will not pay for this to happen. They will take all the different types of chemo. You thought there was only two or three? No, 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 no. There are hundreds of different types of chemo chemicals. And they will apply all the different types of chemo chemicals to different samples of your exact tumor. They will find out which is the most effective at killing the cancer. They will take that chemo, and that's the one that you will be provided with for a massive fee. And you'll pay your money and take this chemo, which will kill the cancer so fast and so much easier that your hair doesn't fall out, your skin doesn't go bad, you don't lose massive amounts of weight, it's still not comfortable, and it doesn't work every time, and some cancer is untreatable, but your odds of survival are so much higher. So much higher. I hear of people dying of cancer all the time. When's the last time you've heard of someone really rich and really important dying of cancer? Answer that question, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was stupid. Steve Jobs got cancer, which was stage one cancer, very treatable. Decided to go and meditate and eat fruit and take juices because some hippies told him that would cure it. And then he died of cancer. Of course he did. But if Steve Jobs had used his money and his finances to get the type of treatment I'm talking about, he'd still be alive today. How many really rich, famous people have battled and died from cancer in the last 10 years that you can think of? Yeah, exactly. Poor people don't know that real health care exists. Oh, a very good friend of mine has been messing around with dentists in the UK for a long time. He's got a lot of teeth falling out. I'm not going to say his name. His uh, jaw bone is eroding. He's been to dentists in England hundreds of times. They've just put injections in his mouth to try and stop the bone erosion. I took him to a dentist um, and I offered to pay for his treatment. He's a very dear uh, friend of mine. I've known him for many years. His treatment is going to cost me upwards of £50,000 to completely fix his jaw bone, bone graft from a, from, flown in from a, from a cadaver... Um, uh, a cadaver bone graft from a, from a donor, I guess. Uh, new teeth put in, etc. And he's going to be fixed in, in no time. Money buys healthcare. And if you think you have healthcare, you do not. That's what I would say is the most crazy thing about having money. Um, and yeah, poor people don't know things like the cancer treatment I was talking about exist. And it's very sad because, you know, everyone has to die of this. And, you know, it, I wish governments could do better. And I wish this was readily available for everybody. But that's not the way the world works, unfortunately. This is horrible. Okay, on to a happier topic. Tristan, why do you read books and Andrew doesn't? Listen, Andrew's right. Reading is basically a waste of time. Reading is a substitute for Netflix. Reading is entertainment. Reading does not help you. This is why I don't read self-help books. Uh, I believe that that is success porn. Read, people reading these books about get rich and do well. How many people do I know who read these books and ever got rich? Zero. Zero. When they talk about reading helps you. Reading is entertainment. So if you read the James Bond novels for entertainment, it's better than watching the James Bond movies. I believe that it's a higher form of entertainment than Netflix and TV. 
but it's essentially just Netflix for the brain. So um, yeah, reading is, is a waste of time if you want to get rich, I agree. But there is one TV show, which I'm going to talk about now. And we never talk about it on an emergency meeting live because my brother has not seen this show. But I was at somebody's house about three years ago, four years ago. And I watched episode one of a show which has 11 series to it. And it was so fucking excellent that I watched all of it. Now, I believe this TV show to be a intellectual and cultural masterpiece. And it is the greatest show that has ever, ever been broadcast on television. And I'm talking, of course, about the show Trailer Park Boys. Now, if you don't know that show, I won't be surprised. It wasn't the most popular show in the world. If you do know that show, and you are surprised that I've said it is a cult cultural and intellectual masterpiece, give me five minutes to explain to you why. If you know anything about me and my brother, our struggles to get rich, our funny stories we have from being broke, our you know brotherhood that we have, our team around us that help propel us to the top, you will appreciate the Trailer Park Boys. And if you are watching Netflix and you somehow can't resist keeping your hands off the Netflix buttons, I don't want you to watch anything but Trailer Park Boys from now on until you finish the entire 11 series. Let me explain to you. If you watch the show, you'll understand. It encapsulates the importance of friendship, brotherhood, and teamwork. You have Julian, who I guess would be Andrew. Ricky, who I guess would be me. A bit crazier, but always has Julian's back. And Julian's always trying to think of great new ideas and great new schemes to make money and get successful and break out the trailer park. I grew up on a council estate, which is essentially the trailer park version of the United Kingdom. This show is set in Canada. Canada and the United States have trailer parks. Um, the importance of brotherhood and friendship and sticking together is a massive underlying theme of the show. Um, also, the importance of enjoying your current circumstances. Keep working, keep hustling, keep grinding, try and get out, but enjoy yourself while you're at it. Now, these people are always on the show. They're actors, but of course, the, the characters on the show are always getting drunk and getting high and whatever, enjoying themselves, but having a good old time. And me and my brother back in the day when we were you know, young and completely broke, always had a good time and we have lots of good memories and we were always smiling the entire time. But also, it's, it's a show about perseverance. It's a show about trying to always better your situation. Uh, these guys never make it out. Obviously, the, the actors are, have done very well for themselves, but the characters of the show have never made it out. Uh, they're still living in the trailer park, but they're always striving for something better, and they're always trying to do better. So when you look past the bullshit of the, the drinking and the crime and the going to jail and all the crap that the show's about, and actually look at its underlying themes, I really believe it to be an absolute masterpiece. And um, these guys still want a podcast. I think it's called the SwearNet Podcast. So shout out to them. I would, even though no matter how big I get, even though, you know, we're, you know, Andrew's talking to the biggest podcast in the world, I will do podcasts with millions and millions of subs. I don't know how, don't know how big the SwearNet Podcast is, but regardless of how famous I get, if these guys invited me to Canada to have some drinks with them and talk on their podcast, I would come anytime, absolutely anytime. So get this over to John Paul Tremblay and let him know that I'm happy to come on the show. Trailer Park Boys, number one show ever, ever made. Besides that, TV's a waste of time. Especially the news. So, <laughs> hmm. Is it tough for fans and haters that recognize you and Andrew publicly? Um, I, I answered this question, Toxic Theo 21, simply because I want people to try to be a little bit smarter when approaching, not just me, it doesn't bother me, um, but people in general. Uh, one, it doesn't bother me at all. I've, I've been a man working behind the counter in a fast food restaurant that millions of people would see per year and nobody would remember who I was. I've been an absolute nobody uh, in that sense. And I believe this is a natural part of my journey. Uh, I've, I've become very wealthy. I, I've now um, harnessed a lot of attention. A lot of eyes are on me and a lot of people pay attention to what I say. Good. And I'm happy that I'm influencing young men for the better. I'm happy that I'm in a position to, that my voice is heard by so many people. And if getting annoyed a little bit when some people don't know how to approach you in the street is the price I pay, I'm happy to pay it. But let me just talk about etiquette very slightly. And this isn't for my benefit. 
this for the benefit of all famous people in the world, or all well-known people, or all public people, or whatever, whatever you want to call them. There is a time and place to be asking for pictures. And you also have to understand that people's time is valuable. If I'm waiting for a taxi outside a building, and you come up and say, hey, Tristan, big fan of you, I'd like to take a picture with you, I'd say yes. I'm literally waiting for a taxi. It'd be a real dick move on my part to say, no, get lost, get out of my face. Um, I absolutely will take a picture with you. If, I, if you catch me walking on the street, I'll even stop for a second and take a picture with you. But I was in Dubai Mall recently and word started spreading that I was in Dubai Mall and I was walking to an ATM and there was about 40 people behind me waving their phones, like a picture, picture, about 40 different people. If you thought, if you were in that crowd, that I was going to stop on my way to an appointment and take 40 different pictures and let the crowd get bigger and stand there all day taking pictures. I'm not going to do that. You caught me at the wrong time. I was sitting at a dinner table with a beautiful lady in London not so long ago. And some guys tapped me on the shoulder when I was halfway through a sentence. I thought it was someone I knew. In London, I'm ex extra jumpy anyway because I like to wear expensive watches. And they're like, hey, hey, you're Tristan. Can I take a picture? And I said, get the fuck away from me. Like, I'm on a date. What are you doing? Like, what the fuck? This is a five-star restaurant. I'm on a date. Get the fuck away from me. And they probably thought, oh, that Tristan Tate, he's a dick. No, my friend, I'm polite. You are a dick. Who are you to go and interrupt somebody's conversation? Business, meeting, date, otherwise. Have a little bit of, you know, social intelligence. Look at this situation that the person's currently in and ask them politely or leave them the fuck alone. So, but all in all, no, it doesn't bother me. In fact, I like it. I like when young men come up to me and say, hey, man, I started doing push-ups. I started working out at the gym. I started doing kickboxing. Uh, I, I convinced my family to eat healthier food. No matter what they say based on my recommendations, I'm very, very happy uh, when young men come, uh, come up and say that kind of thing to me. So don't let that discourage you. But if you see me like in a one-on-one -on -one meeting at a table, don't get up from your table and walk over to me. That's fucking weird. Mike D'Angelo, what are your thoughts on bottle girls and taking them seriously in a relationship? I would say that almost all women can be taken seriously in a relationship. The only exception, I would even say, bottle girls, if you don't know, is an, it's an American phenomenon, and I'm going to get onto bottle girls in a minute, and I can rant about them for a second. But bottle girls are the girls that when you order champagne and vodka, they come over with the big balls, they carry them over, and they stand by your table, and they pretend to drink it. And that's what a bottle girl is. Um, I believe that if a girl's a bottle girl, even if a girl is a, um, a, a model, I would even go as far as to say a stripper. You could take a girl seriously if she's a serious girl. Basically any job that she does, which doesn't include having sex with people. If a girl's job includes having sex with other people, you cannot take her seriously. As long as no one else touches her, I believe that there are scenarios, and it's easier with some jobs, harder with some jobs, where you can take her seriously. So, Mike D'Angelo, I would ask you this. What kind of man are you? Are you the type of man that a girl who's a bottle girl could take seriously? Because you have to understand, she might be a good girl. She might not be. But let's say she is a good girl. Even if she is, she's the type of girl who's in the bars and in the clubs, Probably at high-end places because bottle girls don't exist at the street alleys and the, the crappy dive bars. And she's getting approached by rappers, celebrities, football players, NBA guys. And, you know, they're being approached by the, the best of the best men in the world. Are you the type of man that could keep a girl who has the attention of the best men on the planet pointed towards her? If you are, then good. If she's a good girl, I'm sure you can take her seriously. But I have a little bit of a rant to talk about bottle girls and why it's an indicator of a failed society. Bottle girls are an indicator of a failed society. And I'll tell you why. Clubs in the world should have loads of beautiful girls at the tables and in the club anyway. That's how clubs work. You shouldn't go to a club and have ugly women around. I don't think that that's the indicator of a good club. I think that's the indicator of people having low standards, society having low standards, the nightlife and the men having low standards. If I go to a club in Romania or Poland, you know who brings the bottles over? Men. Men my age or middle-aged men. They bring the bottles over and they're very attentive and they're wonderful waiters and they're professionals and they keep your glasses full. They're great. Mail service. Why are the 
guys, men, some American laughed at this. He saw one of my Instagram stories. He goes, uh, men, bring your bottles over. I'm like, yeah, because all the women in the club are smoking hot and beautiful. And I'm bringing bottles so the women can drink. I don't need them intimidated by some bimbo in a bikini. I don't need some bimbo in a bikini flirting on me when I'm with some beautiful women at a nightclub. I believe that bottle girls are when all the women in the club are so ugly that you need to buy champagne and vodka to have a beautiful girl even talk to you. Which of course is the indicator of a failed society. So no, I don't believe that bottle girls are a good thing at all. Um, you could probably trust a girl who's a bottle girl a lot less than you could trust a girl who works in an office. But I believe if you're a good quality man, there are some good women out there working a job as a, it's essentially a waitress in the nightclub as a bottle girl. So, you know, if you are a good girl and you do bottle service, don't start sending me messages saying I said you were all trash. Don't cut sound bites out of this because I didn't say that at all. I'm a very understanding person. So, let's see what's next. Now, these are, these are all surprises now because I've covered most of the ones from, uh, from Instagram. Miguel Legacy. I'm 21 and I've met a 20 year old moral Christian woman. Um, would it be a delusion to pursue marriage so young or stupid? I believe I'd be happy with her honestly. Miguel, if you believe you'd be happy with her, who am I to tell you not to? I personally think there should be a bigger age gap between men and women, not just one year. That's my personal take uh, on the universe. But Miguel, I'm not the boss of you. And you know this girl better than me. And I honestly, if you really think that she's a woman who would make you happy and you want to marry her and you want to start a family young, if you're in the financial position to do so, I absolutely advise you to follow your heart and do what makes you happy. And I hope you, you two are very, very happy together. I really do. And that would be absolutely wonderful. And I'd love in 10 years if you sent me pictures of all your kids and be like, oh, look, you told me to propose to her. That would make me fucking the happiest man in the world. So yeah, good luck with her, Miguel. See, you obviously haven't been watching the podcast if you're still watching, if you're still asking questions about Muslim, etc., uh, about Andrew's conversion to Islam, etc. Now, I'm going to cover a few generic questions. I've had a bunch of questions about what the real world is, and I've had a bunch of questions about what, how do I make money? So the most common question I'll get, not just now, but throughout just being on Instagram in general, hundreds a day, hundreds of you young men a day will send me messages like, Hey man, I'm 15 and I'm from Latvia. What advice would you give? Hey man, I'm 17, I'm from Greece. What advice would you give? Hey man, I'm 16, I'm from Spain. What advice would you give? But you're all asking me how to make money. You're all asking how to level up in the world and how to, I look, I get it, but I can't reply to them all. So when I do podcasts like this, I like to address these generic blanket questions so you all know what my answer is. Me and my brother are, uh, we try to spread positivity throughout the world. And we had a program once called Hustlers University. It was a great program. We had 18 different millionaires teaching 18 different methods of wealth creation, uh, verified millionaires. They were your professors. They were your teachers inside of Hustlers University. And people could join and ha go from having no network, no millionaires who talked to them, no rich people instructing them on anything, to having 18 people giving hours of lessons every day on how to make money in either cryptos, stocks, affiliate marketing, web design, all the various different uh, modern days of uh, modern ways of wealth creation. And the real world is essentially the evolution of Hustlers University. There's a link to it in this chat. There's a link to it underneath this broadcast. If you're interested in learning how to make money, if you're interested in joining a network of people where verified rich, verified millionaire status individuals are going to instruct you on how they made money, coach you, teach you, help you hone your skills, uh, then that is a program that you should definitely be a part of. You'll learn a lot. You'll probably earn a lot. And it's, you go from a man with having no millionaires on your phone, nobody important to talk to, just messaging your friends all day, to being inside a network of not just the, the guys who are instructing you, but also you're a part of a community of uh, young men mainly, some older men, some women, who want to strive to be more financially secure and more free from the matrix in this world. So the, the real world is 
an absolutely wonderful program. It's the evolution of Hustlers University. We've kept this very quiet until very recently because the Matrix was still trying to shut us down. They were still trying to silence me and Andrew. Uh, they've absolutely and utterly failed. And uh, yeah, the real world is live and it's, it's a wonderful program and I'm even in there myself. So, uh, and I learn from there. So if I can learn something, you better believe you can learn something. I think, even though my cigar is not full yet, I am going to call an end to this broadcast. As you can see, you're on the Rumble channel Talisman Tate, which has only 8,000 subscribers. 8,000 subscribers, but there are 12,000, 13,000 people watching live. I'd like you all to subscribe to this if you're watching. I'd like to end with more subscribers than I have currently viewers. Um, if you have any additional questions, you know, message me on Instagram. I'm going to be doing these cigar nights at least once a week, so you can talk to me uncensored. Uh, you, can, you can throw your questions out here and have them answered by, by, by me in, in the public space. Uh, this is going to be a separate thing from the emergency meetings. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed all the advice. Um, you know, follow me on Instagram, follow me on Getter, uh, follow me on Rumble. All the links to, to that are in, the, are in the description to this broadcast. And so is a link to the real world, and I'll see you inside of there. I have plans tonight. I didn't get all dressed up just for you guys on YouTube. I'm not going to tell you what I'm up to, but obviously it's something cool because I'm a cool person. So I've got to go. Peace and love to everybody.